Young Lives Lost. Prayers outside the White House for three North Carolina students as the FBI investigates their deaths. Welcome to the college. The church prepares to create a new class of cardinals. Lifelong Sacrament. A new program helps couples anchor their marriage in Christ. And Old Fashioned. Chivalry is not dead in this new movie that recounts a faith-centered love story. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, February 13th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. The FBI is now investigating the shooting deaths of three young North Carolina students. Many people are raising the question, was this a hate crime against Muslims? Jason Calvey reports from the White House tonight. Jason. Brian, Muslims came here to pray right outside the gates of the White House. They're also demanding a federal hate crimes investigation into those brutal murders in North Carolina. They're mourning these three young Muslims murdered on Tuesday in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. <laughs> More than 5,000 people gathered for the victim's funeral yesterday. One of the victims, My name is Dia Barakat, had planned to spend part of his summer serving Syrian refugees. Have you ever felt helpless about the situation in Syria and felt like you can't do anything about it? Well, this is your opportunity to help. This summer, I'm embarking on a trip to Turkey with 10 dentists to help Syrian refugee students in need of urgent dental care. Now the 23-year-old, his 21-year-old wife, and her 19-year-old sister are dead. Orange County, 911, what's the address of the emergency? I heard about eight shots go off in an apartment. I don't know the number. The victim's family says it was a hate crime. I think if we look at the background of the guy and the messages he has stated on the, on the Internet, it's all about hate. The suspect, Craig Stephen Hicks, describes himself as a gun-toting atheist. He's been charged with first-degree murder. Police say Hicks may have shot the victims over a parking dispute in the condo where they lived. The people praying outside the White House today aren't so sure. It's so absurd. Like, I mean, nobody kills three people over a parking dispute. I mean, maximum you get at the car towed or something. We're not to be hated. We're just practicing our religion, and we're here to build this country, not bring it down. We're American Muslims. Chapel Hill police haven't ruled out whether these people were murdered because of their faith. Uh, the president today spoke out for the first time, calling these murders brutal and outrageous. He says no one should be targeted because of how they worship. Reporting here at the White House, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Pope Francis opens day two of his second consistory with 20 men who will join the College of Cardinals tomorrow. They reflect the diversity of the Universal Church. The new cardinals come from far-flung places, including Vietnam, Ethiopia, and Thailand. Francis formally elevates the 20 new cardinals at tomorrow's ceremony at St. Peter's Basilica. One of the new red hats says Pope Francis is very clear about what the cardinals' priorities should be. The refugees, the poor, those excluded from the economy. And this is very important because this is the choice of the gospel. For the second consecutive consistory, no U.S. Cardinal was named. This consistory comes as the College of Cardinals discusses reforms of the Vatican government. Cardinal Wilfred Napier of South Africa is joining us from Rome. Your Eminence, the College of Cardinals will look a lot more diverse after tomorrow. Do you get the sense Pope Francis handpicked this freshman class? Oh, I'm sure that there was a lot of uh, assistance given to him. He's very much a, a team uh, player, so I, I would say he, he asked a lot of pertinent questions and got the right answers, and that's how he made his selection. And certainly he's um, listening very carefully to what was said about the, um, before the conclave, that the, the College of Cardinals, as also other structures at the Vatican, needs to be as international as possible. Well, when I was growing up, you had to be Italian to be a, a pope. Then we had... Wojtyla from Poland, Ratzinger from Germany, and now Bergoglio from uh, Latin America. Do you see a day when we'll see a pope from Africa or perhaps Asia? Well, I suppose it's, it's always nice to speculate 
but uh, the, for me, it's not so. Uh, the, 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 the origin, the place of origin of the Pope isn't so important as that the right person is there at the right time, reflecting the concerns of the church at, the, at that worldwide level. And I'm sure this is what Pope Francis is doing so successfully, is uh, reflecting that the church is a universal church and it's spread all over the, the, the world. And of course, reform has been the buzzword there in Rome as you cardinals meet. What do you think of the reforms proposed so far? Oh, the, the, I, I think the, the response here is um, very positive. Uh, the, the, the relationship between the Pope and the College of Cardinals is one where it's real fraternity. You know, you can feel that uh, what he said at the beginning of the Synod in October last year, please be open and frank but listen humbly, and I think that's the spirit that really does pervade the, the, the whole college at the moment. Do you think average Catholics in the pew will feel the effects of these reforms once they're implemented? Oh, I'm sure they are. I mean, I, I, when my experience has been that in South Africa, for instance, even non-Christians are sending messages with me whenever they know I'm coming. They say, please give this message to Pope Francis. The most recent one was uh, at a celebration of Independence Day at the Durban Consulate of the United States. And a young Hindu man came to me and he says, please, are you going to Rome? I said, yes. He said, please tell Pope Francis, this young Hindu says, Pope Francis, you are cool. Well, you can <laughs> imagine the Pope was quite amused to hear that expression used of himself. Well, what a great story to share with us. And Your Eminence, we thank you for joining us from Rome tonight. Cardinal Wilfred Napier of South Africa, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. It's always lovely to, uh, um, to spot, talk to brothers and sisters all over the world. Indeed. Well, fierce fighting rages on in eastern Ukraine as a ceasefire deadline approaches. Ukraine's military says eight soldiers were killed and 34 wounded in fighting overnight. The combat between government troops and Russian-backed separatists appears to have escalated. This just hours after leaders of Russia, Ukraine, Germany and France finalized a tentative peace agreement. The deadline for ending hostilities is just after midnight local time on Sunday. Taliban militants stormed a Shiite Muslim mosque in northwestern Pakistan today. Twenty people died in a wave of gunfire and explosions. This is the latest attack against a religious minority that suffered repeated violence. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack in which more than 45 people were wounded. Sunni Muslim extremists often target Shiite religious pilgrims and their places of worship. Hardline Sunnis do not consider Shiites to be true Muslims. More Alabama counties are issuing marriage licenses to gay couples today after a federal judge's latest order. Some counties began issuing licenses on Monday when a hold on that ruling overturning the state's gay marriage ban expired. But Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore told state probate judges that the federal ruling did not apply to them. The district court judge who made the initial ruling is now ordering Mobile County to issue licenses. That order is signaling other counties to follow suit. Congressional Republicans signed legislation approving the Keystone Pipeline today. This formal enrollment of the bill does not mean it becomes law. It has to go to the White House where President Obama threatens to veto it. Republicans will wait to send it up Pennsylvania Avenue until after a week-long recess because they want to be in D.C. for the veto. The pipeline would carry crude oil from Canada to the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Supporters say the huge project will create jobs, but opponents argue it would harm the environment. The president signed legislation this week intended to reduce military suicide, an epidemic now. Our Suzanne LaFranchi spoke with a doctor who helps veterans struggling with mental health issues. Doctor, you were a trauma surgeon in Vietnam, and you yourself, much like MASH, and you yourself suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. What is it like to have this disorder? It's very challenging in, in that it affects every aspect of your life. Uh, your relationships, your prayer life, uh, it, just everything is affected. You said if a helicopter goes over, you sort of cringe. What, is, what does it do? It's a deja vu experience. You're back in the field again. Mm -hmm. It can bring up some very uncomfortable feelings. It sounds like it's, um, it's torturous to live it's like that. It's very torturous, and sometimes it leads many of our vets to suicide. What do you think of what the president has signed into law, the uh, Clay Hunt Suicide Act? I think it's prevention. great. Anything that we can do for our vets to help them in any way possible, that's a plus. 
Here you run, uh, it's the Brothers of Charity, and the Brothers specialize in mental health, and this is the Newman Center? This is the Newman Center. And what are you going to do here? We are going to house veterans with PTSD, uh, also with other medical health issues, and we're going to set up an environment that's going to include good health, good nutrition, uh, group psychotherapy, and less emphasis on psychotropic drugs. And prayer. And prayer. Correct. How big a role will God and prayer play? That's number one, prayer. Why is it so important? I think it's important because you have to establish a, a good relationship with our, with our God. So the Brothers of Charity will live with these veterans? The Brothers will be living in, communion with, in community with the uh, Vietnam vets. And community involvement is so important, isn't it, for churches Absolutely. to do Absolutely. Parishes of and uh, the dioceses of all over the country are getting more involved in helping our vets okay. and addressing the issues that they face. Thank you for your time and your good works. You're welcome. Coming up, a clergy sex abuse survivor now helping the Vatican protect children speaks out. And EWTN's Father Leo Padalinghug and the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See team up to help victims of human trafficking. Thank God for Friday and thank you for joining us on this Friday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. The Vatican Commission is drafting proposals to deal with bishops who cover up clergy sex abuse. This week, a sex abuse survivor on that commission specifically addressed that issue. There have been far too many cover-ups. There have been far too many clergy protected, moved from place to place. This has got to be consigned to history very, very quickly. And if in a year or two, there isn't some firm action on those matters, then I don't think I'll be sitting here talking to you. Um, so, you know, as I say, we're not here for lip service. We're here to protect our children. Pope Francis wrote an open letter to bishops saying priority must be given to protecting children and not avoiding scandal. Monsignor Stephen Rossetti has been closely involved in the church's response to clerical abuse. Let's talk about what the church has put into this response. We don't hear that much. Well, Brian, what hasn't been told is that the church has done a lot in this country and, and several others. Last year, the American bishops spent $43 million just on child protection, not legal uh, suits, but simply on educating people and trying to prevent child abuse. And over 5 million Americans have been trained in child protection by the Catholic Church to date. I should point out that you're a licensed psychologist. You advise the U.S. Catholic bishops on child protection. To your knowledge, has any bishop ever been removed or even penalized for covering up? No, and it's sad. I think that uh, all we know about, we all know Cardinal Law resigned. Uh, we know that Bishop Finn in Kansas City is being investigated currently. Uh, but uh, that's about it that I know of. With the new guidelines that are being put together, will there be a possible dismissal of bishops and what, what those guidelines might look like? Well, we don't know. We, we do know for certain that the, the commission has set forth some uh, uh, recommendations to Pope Francis on accountability for bishops. And, and we all think Pope Francis will be very, very uh, uh, acceptable, accepting of this. And, we, and it has Cardinal Sean O'Malley's uh, support as well. What would it look like? Hard to say. Currently under the canon law, you can dismiss a bishop, generally speaking, for malfeasance. But I think all of us would like to see some more specific thing in canon law saying, if you do this regarding minors, you're gone. When the Pope sent a letter out about this, it went to bishops around the world. So is this a worldwide problem? Well, that's important. I mean, uh, in the beginning, everyone said this is an American problem. And then everyone said, no, no, it's, it's an American and a European problem. And then it's an English-speaking problem. And then it's, a, then, then it's a northern problem. I mean, eventually, it's been spreading around the world. I think everyone who works in the, the field of child protection uh, says there is some abuse of minors going around the, around the world in different uh, 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 cultural fashion, if you will, in different countries. But in every country I've ever seen, there is some child abuse going on. So the Pope wants to address this at a global level. Well, it's, it's, it's exciting, frankly, for us to have been working in this field for a long time that he is basically saying he sent that letter around a couple weeks ago to every Episcopal conference saying, basically, you, you will have guidelines, and here's some of the things we're expecting. And one of those was accountability. We need to be accountable, first of all, to the public and to the civil law. If it's a case of child abuse, you need to report this to civil authorities. Well, as these guidelines become more clear, we'll rely on you for more interpretation. Thank you, Monsignor. Thanks, Brian. We appreciate it. 
Pope Francis calls on all nations to fight human trafficking, or more bluntly, modern-day slavery. His message is trickling down to the grassroots level in Rome. Our Alan Holdren reports tonight. The U.S. Embassy to the Holy See is teaming up with EWTN's Father Leo Padalinghug to help victims of human trafficking from the kitchen. As part of the mission of the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See and GraceBeforeMeals.com, we really want to cook for people who need it the most, who hunger. And this is actually going to be used for um, uh, a shelter dedicated to women who are involved in human trafficking and their children. They're preparing a simple meal for victims of domestic violence and forced prostitution. It's a hidden scourge, but it is, it is around us. And so if you open your eyes, you can do something and do something powerful. It's a small act of charity, they say, but their bigger goal is to shed light on the issue. Here at a home in the heart of Rome, just a handful of the millions of people suffering due to human trafficking today are getting help. The sisters, who are working with the victims and their children, say that here the women get a fresh start at life. What is the, the service that you offer? It's not just welcoming them, not just being with them and suffering with them, accepting their explosions and silences, but also promoting the person. It's a very delicate job, but these sisters are helping, one person at a time. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, as National Marriage Week ends, we look at reviving marriages through prayer and reflection. And an old-fashioned love story you may want to enjoy with your sweetheart this Valentine's Day. This Friday evening, the 13th day of February. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with the EWTN News Nightly team, and tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, also the culmination of National Marriage Week. It is an opportunity to affirm the gift of the sacrament of marriage. Tonight, Wyatt Goolsby shows us a growing program that aims to do just that. She is the mother of my children. Every day, Dave and Maggie Tamelis of Virginia take time out of their busy schedules to pray together. Why? To make sure Christ is always at the center of their marriage. Marriage is not just for two people, it's three. When we take our vows, God is part of that the vow. Now Maggie and Dave are encouraging other couples to do the same through Marriage in Christ. It's a five-week seminar popping up in cities across America. The goal? To provide a spiritual plan for couples to pray together. By giving us this simple format, it really helps us to set aside the chaos of the day and to be able to focus on one another, united in Christ, inviting the Holy Spirit into the marriage. The seminar is an outreach program by People of Praise, a nationwide charismatic movement. Bill Walker serves on the program's executive committee. He hopes the seminar will provide an alternative to a secular consumer society he says is damaging marriages across the country. It's like. Uh, if you buy a, a, a new car or a new toaster and, and it either doesn't work or you get tired of it, you can get a new one. And there's very much of that in our current marriage culture today. The outreach seems to be working. In the past year, dozens of couples have volunteered to lead seminars nationwide. For Dave and Maggie, their daily prayer routine now includes the entire family, all eight children with one on the way. They say taking the time to strengthen their marriage provides a foundation of love they hope to pass on to future generations. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Night. Thank you, Wyatt. Eric Washam with Catholic Match Institute joining us. And you wrote that you didn't feel happy right after you got married, and your dad shared some advice or some really insight with you, saying the people in his generation didn't expect marriage to be easy. Did you? I did. I did. That was. Uh, I expected it to be feelings based and, and and a smooth ride once I got in, and it wasn't, and that, that confused me. You know, was... marriage is a huge life change. Can you prepare for that? You have to really die to your single self, don't you? You do. You can't prepare for it, and uh, that was one thing that I didn't do, or many things that I didn't do. Um, and it's something we're trying to do through Catholic Match Institute and with CatholicMarriageWeek.com to help singles prepare for marriage, promote a culture of marriage so that they are prepared. More than, more than just bringing them together, uh, prepare them for their vocation. So you and your wife met online about five years after you had gone on Catholic Match. How is that courtship, that cyber courtship, compared to the person to person? Well, ours was not that, our courtship online was not that uh, 
long. Once we met, uh, I didn't want it to turn into this back and forth emailing, texting thing, and this sort of separate, you know, uh, mm -hmm. distance. Uh, we met relatively quickly. I think it was about a week. I said, look, let's just meet, see what's going on. Let's talk to each other and, uh, you know, start the, start the ball rolling. So. I, I guess because it's Catholic match, does it give you a better opportunity to meet people who are perhaps on a similar faith journey? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I it, it's overwhelming, I think, sometimes. if you, I came back to the faith after many years of not being Catholic, and so I wanted... I knew what I wanted. I wanted a woman who was uh, who's, was serious about her faith, and, and this seemed like a place where I could find people who are serious about their faith, and it was. Uh, but I still fell in, uh, you know, into a lot of the same old traps of just maybe getting a little too used to trying to find somebody perfect, which you cannot do. Yeah. Uh, the day we're perfect, perhaps we'll find someone else who's perfect. Right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Any thoughts on the, as we end National Marriage Week, uh, for those who might be f find a little anxiety, um, like you did. Yes, I would say if you do feel anxiety, first of all, just feel it and act anyway. You know, you're going to feel a little anxiety and fear no matter what you do in life. If it's a big change, and especially if you're dealing with another person, this is a big step. It's a vocation after all. But I would say feel it, do it anyway. You'll get over it. It's not something that's uh, not conquerable. It's a fact that we have feelings, but feelings aren't fact. Feelings are <laughs> not fact. They're horrible indicators sometimes yeah. of reality. From Catholic Match Institute, Eric Washam. Thanks. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, Brian. Right. This Valentine's Day, one film hopes to bring chivalry back. Old Fashioned is a romantic drama about a Midwestern couple, Clay and Amber. Clay pursues Amber in courtship that honors their faith in God. The film's already won awards and is being touted as the anti-Fifty Shades of Grey. With our Catherine Zeltner, we meet the man who made the film. Rick Swartzwelder is the writer, director, and actor in the movie Old Fashioned. Rick, congratulations on the premiere. What motivated you to make this film? Well, think honestly, it was uh, just a group of us hanging around many years ago, singles of a variety of Christian faiths, from early 20s all the way up to mid-30s, and just regular guys and girls trying to figure out the whole dating thing and how to, how to find someone to marry, share life with, but also these are people that loved God and we also loved movies and we were talking that we had never seen a film that really told our story uh, you know guys and girls trying to figure out this uh, love thing but also uh, do it in a way that honors God you know most films romantic dramas romantic comedies you have one impossibly good-looking person looks at another impossibly good-looking person and in about 10 minutes they're hooking up and everything is hunky-dory and that wasn't our experience and it wasn't what we aspired to so we thought we would try to tell that story so Clay and Amber are the couple portrayed in Old Fashioned. How does their relationship contrast with couples featured in those other films you're referencing? Well, I think the biggest thing, I mean, it's tricky because film is a visual medium. So by its nature, it's going to emphasize physical chemistry. That's just what movies do. But we really tried very hard to not just have physical chemistry between Clay and Amber, which is there, but we also wanted emotional chemistry and spiritual chemistry and the idea of taking one's time that the, you know love doesn't happen always uh, right away and to have a deliberate pace that sort of more more is more in line with how things go in life as opposed to the now 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 of, of most films that are of this nature so why do you think our culture needs to hear this message today well, I think with the explosion of the hookup culture and the rise of uh, films that are really pushing the envelope in terms of explicit content, uh, it's really time to broaden the cultural conversation uh, because there are things that we see in films that when we play them out in real life can leave a lot of damage and wreckage, and we need to talk about that and acknowledge it up front because it's not just us watching the movies, it's also young people watching the movies because we live in a time and an era with, with access like this where you can see anything pretty much any time. Uh, regardless of your age. And so we need to have this discussion because we, uh, the stories we tell shape who we become. Rick Swartzwelder, thank you for joining us from New York City. Congratulations again on the premiere. Thank you so much. And thank you, Catherine. Until Monday, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on YouTube. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick, and please remember to pray for the new Cardinals who will be elevated this weekend and for all of our faithful clergy. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you.